Earlier this year, Professor Stephen Hawking warned the human race that, unless we found a way to colonize another planet in the next 100 years or so, we would face the very real threat of extinction. He said that with climate change, overdue asteroid strikes, epidemics and population growth, our own planet is becoming increasingly precarious. The idea of a brave band of people leaving Earth to start a new life elsewhere in a galaxy isn't new. Rocket pioneer Robert H. Goddard described an interstellar arc in 1918, and 10 years later, his Russian counterpart Konstantin Silovsky, known as the father of astronautic theory, wrote about a Noah's Ark that would fly in space for thousands of years. But there are a stack of seemingly insurmountable problems to building a ship like that. With the exception of the Moon and Mars, we still don't know where it might go. And it's likely that the construction process would involve the kind of international teamwork that seems almost impossible in today's political environment. But those issues aside, what are the main problems facing the crew of a space arc? The first is how to keep it moving. Where will its engines get their energy from? In the 1950s, Project Orion, not to be confused with NASA's Orion Space Program, explored the idea of powering a vehicle by detonating atomic bombs at its rear. The explosions would be so powerful that they would take place outside of the craft because they destroy it if they took place inside. Model test flights began flown in 1959 and were relatively successful. The Project Orion concept was taken further by the British Interplanetary Society who started Project Daedalus in 1973. But it wasn't strictly a space art concept. Instead, the aim was to send an unmanned spacecraft to a nearby star within a human lifetime. The target was Barnard Star, 5.9 light years away, to be reached during a 50 year flight. Since 1998, the Pennsylvania State University has continued the Orion-based experiments. Dr. Robert Ensman proposed the Ensman Starship in 1964. It would be fueled by a frozen sphere of deuterium a million tons in weight, with a cylinder more than 500 meters long attached behind it. The deuterium would power a set of nuclear fusion rockets, with three 90-meter living compartments capable of containing more than 200 people. Whilst the propulsion is still under research, the next problem is reliability. With no one in the emptiness of space able to help and turning back not being an option, an interstellar vehicle would have to be incredibly reliable because the crew would have to make any repairs with what they had on board or die in the attempt. Any vehicle carrying the future of humanity to a new destiny would need to be almost infallible. But there's an even bigger problem keeping the crew healthy, happy and focused. Anthropologist John Moore suggested in 2002 a crew of around 160 would be enough to offer sufficient biological diversity to secure the future of the human race beyond Earth. But Cameron M. Smith calculated in 2013 that if accidents and disease are taken into consideration, several thousand people might be needed aboard the one-way flight. Regardless of how many there are, they're all going to face issues no one has ever faced before. That's true of whether the Space Ark is a sleeper ship with everyone on board in suspended animation or a living ship with the crew awake and working. They will know that going home is not an option and wherever they end up will have to become home. They'll experience a different type of social development from what happens here on Earth and no one can say how that might turn out. Spare a thought for the crew of a generation ship. Those who leave Earth know they will die before the journey is over. But the generations born during the flight won't have a home planet and they will live with the knowledge that they are only there to make life better for people coming in the future. There is also the horrifying concept of advances in technology meaning that a better, faster arc is launched after the first one and reaches its target planet sooner so that the first crew, having spent 200 years in flight, arrive to find a human colony which has been there for 100 years or so. The question of how to keep the peace is also a difficult one. The crew would have to become a self-policing community. How could that be enforced? Moore argued that family units have been more successful than military units in colonizations of the past. 
citing the example of the Polynesians, who sent young couples off in boats to find new islands where their children would be born, effectively on a new world. There have been a number of human experiments which have yielded various results. In 2016, NASA completed a year-long isolation experiment involving three men and three women who were locked in a 36-foot diameter dome. NASA said the results proved that a mission to Mars was achievable in human terms, whilst the participants reported that boredom was the biggest enemy and their advice to others was to bring lots of books. But that was for just one year and on Earth and with the participants knowing that it was just a test that could be ended in an emergency. The real thing would bring psychological issues which would have to be planned for well in advance with people that can get along with each other. The last thing you need is people wanting to kill each other by the journey's end or before. There's also yet another issue. If all goes well, there's no epidemic or some other form of disease problem and the space arc is completely reliable and the crew remain focused on their mission, there's the additional possibility of human evolution continuing and taking an unexpected turn. Perhaps a long time after leaving Earth, the people who arrive on the new Earth will be nothing like us at all. So if that's the case, would the human race really have survived? So thanks for watching. I'd just like to say that this episode's shirt was the Tabla Paisley by Madcap England and is available from Atom Retro with worldwide shipping from here in the UK. We also have the Curious Droid Facebook page, the link is in the channel page, and I'd also like to thank all our Patreons for their ongoing support, and if you would like to support us, then please visit the Patreon page and link. So as always, thanks for watching, and please subscribe, rate, and share.